Now, this is one of those Hollywood stories where you're going to be like, hmm, well, I haven't heard this before. <laughs> now, if you don't know who Sarah Vaughn is, she was just the epitome of class and jazz music would not have been the way it was without her. She really had a very gorgeous voice. And the only ones they said that could really rival her was Ella Fitzgerald, you know, stunning, stunning voice. And just success came to her so easily. But the crazy thing is a lot of her success she give thanks to using. And it was a lot of her peers around her. First of all, because I love jazz music, love jazz music, cooking with jazz music, doing makeup to jazz music, etc. And I never thought, you know, Sarah Vaughn was, you know, a user or anything like that. I never knew any of this about her. I just used to listen to her music a lot and love it. I didn't know a lot that we're about to learn in this video. I just didn't know, but we're going to see why her peers and even those around her were like, hey, this is making her more successful in the sense that she wasn't even really crashing out or anything like those other stories that I've given you guys, like Billie Holiday, et cetera. She wasn't really crashing out like that. It was just, it worked for her up until the very end. And then the very end was when she finally saw the repercussions of a lifetime of use. So she did get to suffer some bit, but it just wasn't the case. But before we get into all of that, hey friend, welcome to my channel, Karina Allude, where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars to history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so. And if you're already subscribed, please turn on your notification bell so you never miss an upload. Now, without further ado, let's get into this video. Of course, let's start first with her childhood. So born on March 27, 1924 in Newark, New Jersey, Sarah was the only child of Asbury Jake Vaughn, a carpenter who dabbled in guitar and piano, and Ada Vaughn, a laundry woman with a voice that graced the church choir. The Vaughn family set up shop on Brunswick Street, where Sarah spent her entire childhood soaking up every note and melody that floated through their home. Now, Jake was a devout man, and the Vaughn household was a regular at New Mount Zion Baptist Church, it was here at the tender age of seven that Sarah began her musical journey, starting with piano lessons, then lending her voice to the choir and eventually playing piano for church events. But church music wasn't the only tune Sarah danced to. She had a secret love affair with jazz, sneaking into local bars to catch live performances, and even tickling the piano in her high school jazz band. The plot thickens when in 1939, a stranger knocked on the Vaughn's door, revealing he ran a nightclub in a not so fancy part of town. He'd been mesmerized by young Sarah's talent, both on the piano and behind the mic, and wanted her to play in his club every night. Imagine the shock on Jake and Ada's face, learning that their 15-year-old daughter had been living this double life, sneaking out to perform, which explained why she was always so exhausted during the day and why her window was mysteriously open even in the dead of winter every night. Sarah's passion for music caused quite the stir at home, especially when she decided to drop out of high school to chase her dreams of stardom. I want it, I like it, and I'm going to hit, she declared, leaving her dad Jake fuming with frustration. By her late teens, Sarah was a staple in the local club scene, belting out tunes for anyone who'd listen. Cigarette in one hand, gin with a splash of water in the other. She thrived in the smoke-filled jazz-infused nights, known for her quick wit and colorful language. Sarah was fiercely independent, earning the nickname No Count Sarah among the musicians she befriended, a nod to her self-reliant spirit. Sarah, just 18 years old, struts into Harlem's Apollo Theater on a dare from a friend to enter an amateur contest. She belts out body and soul with such jazz flair that she doesn't just win the contest. She gets a gig for a week at the Apollo too. She later stated to Downbeat, I was going to be a hairdresser before I got into show business. I always wanted to be in show business, and when I got in, I didn't try. I just went to the amateur hour, and in two weeks, I was in show business. It shocked me to death, and it took me a long time to get over that. Before the week was up, Billy Eckstein of the Earl Hines Orchestra spots her, and bam, Sarah's career shoots off like a rocket. And fast forward to April 23rd, 1943, 
And there she is making her professional debut with Heinz. And by 1945, Sarah is flying solo. And in 1947, she ties the knot with trumpeter George Treadwell. One night, he wanders into Cafe Society in Greenwich Village, hears Vaughn singing, and bam, it's love at first note. But here's the kicker. He falls for her voice before he even falls for her. Now, in true showbiz fashion, you know, they always got to make mistakes, these women. The man she marries becomes her manager, which by now, if you don't know, never let your man be a manager. Never, ever, ever. Ever, okay? George grabs the reins of Vaughn's career, dictating everything from her wardrobe to her song choices. And guess what? It does work for a time. Under his wing, Vaughn drops hits like Tenderly and It's Magic, making waves in both the jazz and pop charts. Her salary skyrockets from $250 a week to a whopping $2,000 a week, plus a cut of the door revenue. George is hustling, securing interviews, ensuring radio plays, and even bagging Vaughn awards left and right. But here's where it gets juicy. Vaughn admits she's not great with money, saying, and I quote, he can count good, referring to George's knack for handling their finances. They're both chili lovers, so at least they've got they had that in common. George orchestrates her first national tour, making Vaughn a household name and earning her the nickname, The Divine One. As Vaughn's star rises, she starts missing her jazz roots, feeling a bit boxed in by the pop scene. And despite raking in close to $200,000 a year and selling out Carnegie Hall, she craves more creative freedom. And $200,000 a year was like equivalent to $2 million, okay, of that time. So she splits from Columbia Records and signs with Mercury, allowing her to dabble in both pop and jazz. And in 1951, Vaughn embarked on the first of many European tours where jazz fans and in London, Paris, and Munich flocked to hear the new American phenomenon. Friends remembered that first trip as one long party for Sarah and again expressed amazement that the alcohol, cigarettes, and substances, you know, the coca, only seemed to improve her voice. She had energy, she was friendly, and her voice was just husky and warm every time she was under the influence. They also noted that relations between Vaughn and Treadwell were becoming strained. By the time Vaughn records Broken Hearted Melody, a song she personally finds cheesy, her marriage to George is on the rocks. Despite the song's success and a Grammy nomination, the couple calls it quits. And here's a bombshell. George spills that out of the $150 million that Vaughn supposedly made, only $16,000 was left. Can you imagine how mad you would be? Sound off in the comment section. Imagine you made $150 million and your husband or your wife is your manager. And by the time you're divorcing, there's only 16,000 of it left. She didn't, and she didn't know nothing. She didn't even have a bank account at that time. She didn't deal with the money at all. You see why I say it's a bad idea? Now, what would you do? That's, that's some, ooh, that's, that's, cr I can't even imagine. Where did all that money go? No one knows for sure, but Vaughn always credits George for her rise to stardom, and she wasn't even too mad at him. She just was like, well, you know what, whatever. He did make me super famous, so whatever happened to it, happened to it. I don't know, sis. But it wasn't all glitz and glam. Sarah faced the ugly side of fame too, dealing with dealing with bigotry, you know, between blacks and whites that ranged from crappy dressing rooms to outright attacks. She even got tomatoes thrown at her during a Chicago gig. But Sarah, she never let the haters keep her down, constantly pushing her vocal limits until she was belting out tunes that left everyone a fan. Now, most singers might chill in their hotel rooms after a show, but not Sarah. She was right there with the band drinking, smoking, and you know, cursing like a sailor. It was during these hangouts that she got hooked on the coca, you know, a habit that stuck with her for ages. But no matter how hard she partied or how little sleep she got, her voice just kept getting better. Her renditions of He's Funny That Way, Once in a While, and Sweet and Lovely became the gold standard. Not long after she said goodbye to George, Sarah jumped right into another marriage with Clyde B. Atkins. Now, CB was quite the character and claimed he was a big shot with a fleet of taxi cabs and even dabbled in professional football, though he didn't know the first thing about music. He was like lying legion, okay? He was just lying about his credentials. But Sarah, she was smitten, you know, because she handed over the reins of her career to this new guy. She didn't learn from her first marriage, so she made him her manager launching the Divine One, her new management company. 
Just crazy, crazy, crazy. She wasn't slowing down either though. Like the first marriage, at first, everything was popping off. It was working out great. Sarah waved goodbye to Mercury Records, signed on with Roulette Records, and jetted off to Europe to serenade folks at the Brussels World Fair in 1958, all thanks to an invite from the State Department. Sarah and CB also adopted a daughter, Deborah, in 1961, who goes by Paris Vaughn now and is also a movie star, and painting the picture of a perfect little family to the public. But let's not sugarcoat it, behind closed doors, it was anything but perfect. Friends spilled the beans that CB was a nightmare, keeping Sarah under lock and key unless she was performing. Gambling away her earnings, and I hate to say it, getting violent with her in, in a way that makeup could not cover up. Sarah even claimed the guy threatened her life many times when she tried to escape. When she finally had enough and filed for divorce in 1962, the aftermath was a financial disaster. CB had left her drowning in $150,000 debt. At least her first husband left her $16,000. This one left her nothing but actually put her in debt with the IRS. The IRS wasn't having any of it and seized her home in Newark for back taxes. So Sarah and Deborah ended up crashing with John John Preacher Wells, an old friend from way back then, who also turned into her manager and lover. So she went for a third round. <sighs> but let me not victim shame, I guess, but oh my goodness, you know? Preacher was a godsend though for the time that he was with her, getting Sarah's finances in order and even setting her up with her very first official checking account. So she started to finally have a little control over her money and have a bank account, okay? But old habits die hard. And according to Roy McClure, who played bass for Sarah, she'd indulge in a wild mix of substances, alcohol and cigarettes before hitting the stage. But then bam, she'd sing like an angel. And then those substances kind of made her turn a blind eye to her regular life. She became like, basically a little girl in her private life where the men just was doing everything for her and you know they had just full control over her she was just constantly not in her right mind and it made her an easy target to take advantage of so that's the downside of it too as the 60s rolled on rock and roll started elbowing jazz out of the spotlight sarah's golden hits from back in the day were now considered oldies always looking to push her boundaries she recorded the messiah with quincy jones and even toyed with the idea of opera but from 1967 to 1970 she was off the record label grid making no new recordings eventually sarah and preacher called it quits she moved with deborah to los angeles trying to keep the music alive by showing up at concerts and jazz festivals often sharing the stage with legends like Billy Eckstein, Ella Fitzgerald, and Carmen McRae. And after a string of rocky relationships and financial ups and downs, enters Marshall Fisher. Now, Fisher wasn't just any guy. He was a successful Chicago restaurateur with a big heart for jazz and an even bigger heart for Sarah. So let's see. He first laid eyes on her after a gig in California and was smitten. And despite the racial differences, Fisher being white and Sarah being, you know, the fabulous African-American diva that she was, the love blossomed even though there was a lot of backlash, okay? Friends said it best. He hustled her music, not her money. So he was all about the music and making her money and wasn't, you know, really wasting it like the other guys. And the racial differences didn't mean a thing to, to Sarah or to any of us end quote. Marshall was a full package, ensuring Sarah looked the part, sang the right tunes, and rubbed elbows with the who's who of the scene. He even got her to move into a nice pad in Hidden Hills, Los Angeles with him, and the press ate it up, calling Marshall her hubby, even though they never made it official at the altar. But as with all good things, this too came to an end when Sarah fell for Wayman Reed, a young, younger trumpeter with a taste for the bottle and a mind troubled by demons. He was literally losing his mind and people were saying he was demon possessed, all of that, you know. They tied the knot when she was 54, but it wasn't meant to last and they split in 81 because of, you know, his mental illness. And despite the personal drama, Sarah's career was booming. She was raking in the dough from recordings and live gigs, performing for presidents and at prestigious festivals. She kept it real though. As she told Downbeat, and I quote, it's unbelievable, that's what it is, that everybody likes me as well as they do. But I'm the same way now that I was when I was 18. I don't go for that star stuff. All the stars are in heaven, end quote. Her talent and charm didn't go unnoticed. She serenaded at the White House, got props in Congress, snagged an Emmy for a Gershon concert on PBS and even got inducted into the Jazz Hall of Fame. She was nominated for a Grammy nine times and won twice. Plus, she later earned a Grammy for a Lifetime Achievement in 89. Critic Scott Yanow 
hit the nail on the head, calling her voice one of the most wondrous voices of the 20th century. And in the late 80s, our jazz queen wasn't feeling too hot. She was battling arthritis, making her fingers stiff and achy, and she was running out of breath quicker than a candle in the wind. And despite her health, throwing curveballs left and right, Sarah kept pushing forward because that's just who she was, a fighter. But things took a sharp turn when she had to bow out of a gig at the Blue Note in New York. Turns out she was up against a much tougher opponent, lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Finally caught up to her, her time of using, etc. And she quickly started to deteriorate. On a warm July evening in 1990, Sarah was resting at home, watching a TV film starring her daughter, Deborah, who was making waves in the acting world. And just like that, in the quiet comfort of her home, Sarah Vaughn took her final breath. Sarah Vaughn, ever humble, once shared a thought with Leonard Feather that will stick with you. She said, and I quote, It's a nice feeling to know that people will remember you after you've gone, that you managed to be a little bit of history. End quote. And let me tell you, she wasn't just a bit of history. She was, is, and always will be a monumental chapter in the story of music. I want you guys to leave flower emojis in the comments for her because... She does deserve her flowers. Not too many people are familiar with Sarah Vaughn. Comment below if you've heard her music before. What's your favorite song? She was just an icon and it's just this video. I don't want you now to think after this video that, hey, I should go and, you know, hit the Coca-Cola. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe I'll, you know, sound better and da da da. No, it always catches up to you. And the dark side of it was that it just left her in a state. She had no control over her life. And someone always had to have control. Like she would be in these marriages with men that just had to do everything for her, take control of everything. And she was making money like crazy. And they were just attaching themselves to her to take her money, et cetera, because she was in her right mind anyways to even count it herself or have a big account or be the boss that she could have been she could have been just so great and is it worth it is it worth it because did she really get to enjoy the money that she had not really so it wasn't worth it but i love you guys so much thank you for tuning in comment below your thoughts and who else would you guys like me to add to my list i'll see you guys on the next one if you like the music you listen to the link is in the description also check out my billy holiday video you might really like it i'll pin it in the comments for you guys until next time